It's a familiar sight outside government and office buildings across the country. Smokers standing in doorways, forced to leave if they want to light up. And the trend is spreading to shopping malls, restaurants and clubs. Now, most people accept the scientific data showing that secondhand smoke can cause cancer. But not this man. John Lewick is a professor with impressive credentials, but he's a skeptic when it comes to secondhand smoke, and he's very vocal about his views. Our colleagues at the Fifth Estate have looked into John Lewick. Here's what Anna Maria Tremonti found out about the consultant. In the debate over tobacco in Canada, Face off. one man keeps showing up. John Lewick is a public policy consultant and author First of you, John of Lewick, how is it you come to believe that uh, secondhand smoke is a bogus menace? I think the important question is that it's not either myself or my co -op. And in the CTV hot seat, Dr. John Lewick, a public policy... We have Dr. Lewick, Dr. John C. Lewick. He's been before was, uh, Senate committees in Ottawa, was, uh, seemingly so self-assured he corrects the parliamentarians who question him. Let me uh, perhaps tread on your hospitality by suggesting that perhaps the question before that you have put is not the correct one. Dr. John Lewick has been at the forefront of an issue the tobacco industry considers one of its greatest liabilities, secondhand smoke. Two years ago, Lewick, a doctor of philosophy, co-authored this book with Dr. Gio Gori, a former head of the U.S. National Cancer Institute. It argues that the link between secondhand smoke and lung cancer is unproven, and it takes aim at those scientists who would unequivocally link the two, specifically the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA arguing that the EPA's own political agenda and corrupt science created the fears that led to smoking bans across North America. The subject of secondhand smoke became a hot-button issue as towns and cities across Canada considered banning smoking in public places. Business owners and workers in Toronto practically rioted when the city tried to ban smoking in restaurants. Lewick's arguments were seemingly powerful ammunition for those opposed to smoking bans. The province's hotel industry brought in a heavy hitter today in its ongoing war against anti-smoking legislation. John Lewick is a policy analyst and he's he is a provocative speaker capable of sowing doubt. He argues over public policy, suggesting democracy at risk and government and scientific manipulation. This discussion paper is so fraudulent in its claims that it astonishes me that it would be produced by anyone in Canada. In the scientific world, the overwhelming majority believes secondhand smoke is dangerous. But in 1998, Lewick found a landmark U.S. court decision on his side. District Court Judge William Austin ruled the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, in its zeal to restrict smoking, had exaggerated the dangers of secondhand smoke. The judge accused it of manipulating the agency's standard scientific methodology. But the other side was also making gains in this fight. A year earlier, an ailing mom from the United States had stared down big tobacco and made it blink. Norma Broin had lung cancer. She'd never smoked, but as a former flight attendant, she spent years on planes thick with smoke. This was before the smoking ban. She blames her cancer on what she said were those enormous quantities of secondhand smoke. She became the poster girl for the anti-tobacco lobby taking the industry to court. Now the fact that I didn't have any of the normal risk factors, but yet I was in such a significant amount of cigarette smoke, it just made sense to me that if cigarette smoke was harmful to a person who smoked, never thought about it before, because I was told, you know, if I didn't smoke as a kid, you know, I wouldn't get those horrible diseases the smokers get. But the more I thought about it, the more the research that I read confirm my belief that secondhand smoke truly caused the same diseases and illnesses that smokers got. In settling this landmark lawsuit on secondhand smokes... A nervous tobacco industry avoided the jury and settled out of court, big time. It agreed to give $300 million to establish a medical foundation to research smoking-related illnesses, and it consented to lifting the statute of limitations so that flight attendants with related illnesses or their survivors, potentially many thousands, could sue. Bill Ferrone is a former tobacco insider who knows the cigarette companies have been concerned about secondhand smoke for a long time. 
Farone was director of applied research at Philip Morris for eight years until they fired him. He says the tobacco company knew very well how dangerous secondhand smoke could be. At the time I was at Philip Morris, we knew that secondhand smoke is dangerous because it contains many of the same chemicals, or virtually all the same chemicals, as mainstream smoke, which we know causes cancer and a variety of other diseases. Farone says that back in the 80s, Philip Morris itself discovered an alarming fact about secondhand smoke and the deadliest of its chemicals, NNK. Research was done in Switzerland, at their laboratories in Switzerland, that showed that for up to six hours after you extinguish your cigarette in an ashtray, that that chemical continues to build up in the room. Now, this is all documented in Philip Morris files. The disagreement is not over which chemicals are in cigarette smoke, but rather the chances of those chemicals actually causing disease in people other than smokers. An impressive array of scientific bodies argues secondhand smoke is damaging. Among them Health Canada, the Canadian Cancer Society, the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Lung Association, the U.S. National Cancer Institute, the U.S. Surgeon General. But in their book, Lewick and Dr. Gio Gori argue the scientific community can't prove how much smoke it takes to be hazardous. They argue that the statistics are weak and those who use them to dictate public policy are not viewing the evidence objectively and are therefore practicing corrupt science. There are other scientists who agree with them, but few appear as strident. Former insider Farone says they've got it backwards. I think the burden of proof is on the other side of the issue to show that the, the levels are in fact safe. And to my knowledge, the, um, neither the industry or the authors of the book you have shown me have done any experiments that show a safe level, for example, of NNK, nicotine nitrosamine ketone, which is one of the deadliest carcinogens. The Canadian Cancer Society's senior policy analyst has written his own book critical of the tobacco industry. Rob Cunningham says the more doubt big tobacco can raise, the more cigarettes it sells. A lot of people quit or cut back because of concerns of secondhand smoke on their children or on their spouse. The industry does not want that to happen. And when there's restrictions on smoking in workplaces and public places, it becomes a hassle in many cases and a great motivator for people to quit. The tobacco companies in the past have won because they said people chose to use our product. The non-smokers did not choose to use their product. They made a conscious decision not to use their product, but yet they're being injured by the tobacco product. The cigarette companies saw this coming back in 1978 when their polling identified secondhand smoke as the most dangerous development to the viability of the tobacco industry. And so Big Tobacco's response was to help create a debate to create doubt. A lot of the debate has come from articles that have been generated by the tobacco industry or other opponents of regulation of passive smoke. Now another case we're doing today is an environmental tobacco smoke case. And Lisa Barrow is a scientist at the University of California and she is no friend of the tobacco industry. When she studied review articles that summarize scientific literature on secondhand smoke, she came to this conclusion. About 40% of the articles, a little less, said that passive smoking wasn't harmful. And almost all of those were funded by the tobacco industry or from tobacco industry affiliated authors. Because of decades of lying and deception, the public very often just doesn't believe the tobacco industry. The industry needs others to fight industry battles. At Philip Morris, we had one uh, person who would go out and try and find people who took positions that would cast doubt on commonly, uh, common pieces of evidence that were used against the industry. Welcome. There are scientists who share the views of Lewick, who's called himself a sometime tobacco consultant. Here's an example of his involvement. So the federal government is lying to us when they say the federal cigarettes government is being are addictive. Extremely untruthful about that. I don't deny that they have a right to hold that opinion. For instance, I'd ask them, where did they get the conclusion that cigarettes are addictive? Well, they had a group of people from the Royal Society of Canada that met over one summer, looked at a few research papers, and then came up with that. Come on, Tom. In the record, Come on. it's entirely what they did. 
no new evidence. They simply looked at research papers. They made a recommendation to Health Canada. You make the people put this on the uh, cigarette packages. And so they decided to lie to us. They You're decided the truth, to. And they're lying. They the decided. The says cigarettes are addictive is exactly. a lie. Exactly. They decided that in the interests of public health, it's yeah. better to exaggerate. Lewick wasn't just on TV, he was published. This article, written by Lewick, showed up in an obscure university alumni magazine. It characterizes as corrupt science the research used to link secondhand smoke to lung cancer. It's a seemingly independent rebuttal to the argument in favor of anti-smoking legislation, one that could be quoted by mainstream media outlets looking for balance in the smoking debate. In the article, Lewick is described only as a non-smoker and a management consultant. But industry documents show tobacco executives actually worked with Lewick to write the article. People are entitled to their own opinion, uh, but there should also be an openness as to the links with the tobacco industry so that the public that is analyzing uh, or assessing these statements is fully aware um, of, of that relationship with the industry. Lewick and Gorey's book makes reference to their past work with tobacco companies, but the Fifth Estate has learned that the publisher, the Fraser Institute, also received money from the industry for a project which included the creation of the book. The crux of the book is that laws restricting smoking are based on corrupt and politically motivated scientific research. It argues, in part, that because a blue ribbon panel criticized some work of the EPA, the EPA's work on secondhand smoke is also suspect. We wanted to talk to Lewick and Gorey, but each refused us an interview. We tried the publisher, the Fraser Institute, but again, we were refused an interview. So we went to a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel at the University of Pittsburgh. The dean here at the School of Public Health was on that panel. Dr. Bernard Goldstein actually praises the EPA's work on secondhand smoke. The Blue Ribbon Panel did not criticize the EPA's view of secondhand smoke. As I say, if we would have considered it, we would have considered it as a poster child for just what EPA should be doing at all times. The book in question says the link between lung cancer and secondhand tobacco smoke is simply politically motivated science. I would have to wonder about the purposes of the people who would uh, relate uh, what our document uh, said to environmental tobacco smoke. We decided to look at the credentials of the man accusing others of corrupt science. John Lewick is an author, a sometime tobacco industry consultant and a public policy analyst. But he didn't start that way. John Lewick was a Rhodes Scholar at Britain's hallowed Oxford University, and he chose to become a professor of philosophy. He came to Canada, and what was then Nazarene College in Winnipeg. On the surface, Lewick seemed to have all the right stuff, and a fellow professor, Martin Gerwin, remembers his early successes. Well, that he was a, a lively and uh, well-educated and competent philosophy, philosopher. It was only when Lewick applied for a full-time position at the more prestigious University of Manitoba that his academic credentials came under scrutiny. Some inquiries were made and it came to light that although he'd been going around saying for several years that he'd completed his DPhil degree at Oxford, in fact he hadn't finished it. So he didn't have a doctorate? Not at that time. Do you remember talking to him about it? Well, yes, I said, when this came to light, I said, uh, John, this is a serious matter. It's, it's not like getting a parking ticket or having a book overdue at the library. People are going to take this very seriously. And um, he seemed to regard it as sort of an administrative matter. And uh, I can only conclude he had a, a, a moral blind spot about that. Fired from Nazarene College, Lewick returned to the academic splendor of Oxford, finishing that PhD he'd claimed to have had years earlier. When Lewick again sought work, Martin Gerwin was sympathetic. Many people thought that that one incident should be just career ending. I personally didn't think so. I thought that uh, he should have the chance to clean up his act. And when I wrote a letter of recommendation for him, which I did, I uh, commended his teaching and his scholarly competence and then said my recommendation is subject to one grave reservation 
and uh, related how he had claimed to have a degree before he really had it. John Lewick ended up at Brock University in Ontario. Among his courses was one in business ethics. Again, he appeared the model academic, prolific, with a growing list of publications to his credit. And again, all was not as it seemed. At the time, in the late 80s, Cecil Abrahams was the Dean of Humanities at Brock, in other words, John Lewick's boss. Abrahams is now back home in South Africa, where he's Vice Chancellor of West Cape University. He remembers the problems that arose when John Lewick came up for academic review. John Lewick always presented a very long list of papers, including books that he said he was uh, just about to submit to various publishers, and he would name these publishers. That made Abraham suspicious. He began to examine Lewick closely. He phoned around to publishers and editors. They said John Lewick would write them letters and suggest they might think about a book with this title along these lines, but then wouldn't hear any more from him. And then he would put it down in his curriculum vita that he had either accepted the book or that he's finishing the book. Abrahams dug further. There were visiting professorships that didn't exist, books and articles that simply didn't exist. I certainly would not trust anything John Luke says because I, he must be the worst case of fraud that I had come across and I've been an administrator at universities for a long period of time on uh, both in uh, North America and in Africa. And I think he's by far the worst case of fraudulent behavior. The Fifth Estate has also obtained this Brock University memo, dated 1990. Its language is strong, citing a pattern of misrepresentations, a breach of professional ethics, and suggesting Lewick would be considered unfit to continue teaching business ethics. His career at Brock was over. John Lewick did contact us with a three-page fax declining an interview, stating he stood by his science. So we are left only with the videotaped record of his declarations on disinformation and misrepresentation. Lying about science and attempting to create public policy decisions based on deceitful information or non-existent information is never in anyone's interest. For The National, I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Still ahead on The National, this story.